Hi there, welcome back. Today we're talking about flow. Whenever I'm around people who are talking about the characteristics of good writing, the word flow seems to come up more often than any other. It would appear that people love writing that flows and they hate writing that doesn't. So everyone wants flow, but I've never really heard somebody say what flow actually means. And let me tell you, it can be pretty frustrating to make your writing flow when you don't even know what you're trying to accomplish. In fact, I think the mysteriousness of the word flow is part of the reason that people think that writing is some arcane talent that only a select few can have. But the fact is that flow isn't as mysterious as we sometimes make it out to be, and anyone can make their writing flow if they know what to look out for. So you don't have to be the chosen one to write with flow. And today we'll be pulling back that curtain of mystery and talking about some of the practical secrets of flow. More specifically, I want to spend some time today talking about how you can make your ideas flow in your writing, something that we'll call semantic flow. In future videos, we'll talk about how you can build sentences that flow and how you can even make the sounds of your writing flowy and nice. So be sure to subscribe so that you'll know when those videos come out. In the meantime though, let's start by understanding what flow even is in the first place. So let's forget about writing for a second. What does flow mean in other contexts? If we think about things that flow, what can they tell us about the qualities that we're trying to emulate in our own writing? Water is probably the most flowy thing that I can think of, so what is it that water is doing when it flows? Well, it's sort of effortlessly flowing along its path. Rivers flow downhill, the tides come in and out, take a drink and the water will flow easily and effortlessly down your throat. Now, I'm no scientist, but I do know that water can flow because the molecules in water are free to move past each other. They don't get stuck when they bump into each other, they just keep going along their way. They just flow. They don't resist gravity, and they don't resist each other. And we could also think about related words like fluid and fluent. Both of those words have to do with flow. And you can imagine somebody doing something with a fluid motion. It's not erratic or halting. It's smooth and it happens without resistance. And if someone speaks a language fluently, they're not stopping to figure out each word as they speak. Again, those words just flow out of them without any kind of resistance. And, at least for our purposes, it's that lack of resistance that's most important. When writing flows, it presents minimal resistance to its readers. So, if you want to make your writing flow, what you want to do is write in a way that prevents your readers from getting stuck. You want your reader, in other words, to move smoothly and effortlessly through your writing. Now, like I mentioned before, there are a few aspects of writing that we can pay attention to when we're thinking about flow. But for today, I want to focus on just one of them, the flow of ideas, which is what we're calling semantic flow, after the branch of linguistics that studies the meaning of words. Because when we're working on semantic flow, what we really want is to make sure that our readers can get what we mean without being confused or having to ask for help. More particularly, I want to talk about three key strategies that you can use to improve the flow of ideas in your writing. Each of these strategies will help you to provide your readers with a path of least resistance so that they can understand your ideas without getting frustrated or giving up. Of course, it's less of an issue now, but back in the far distant past when people had to wait a week between episodes of a TV show, it could sometimes be difficult for people to remember everything that had happened the week before. Add to that the possibility that viewers may have missed an episode here or there along the way, and you wind up with plenty of opportunities for viewers to be confused about what's going on in an episode because they don't have all of the context that they need. That's why, where continuity between episodes is important, a lot of shows will start their episodes with a recap of what happened earlier in the season. It's a way of providing a path of least resistance. Viewers don't have to go back and watch everything to remember what happened, and they also don't have to spend the whole time asking other people in the room what's going on. These episode recaps are a great illustration of an important strategy for improving the flow of your writing. That is, the strategy of helping your readers to find their footing with old information before presenting them with new information. Just like with episode recaps, you want to make sure that your readers know what's going on before you launch into the rest of your paper. 
This is why, as we mentioned in our first discussion about introductions, that it's so important to start your paper with context. You have spent a lot of time researching and thinking and writing about your topic, so you're kind of like somebody who has watched the whole season of a show, but you can't just drop a reader in mid-season and expect them to get into the flow of things without any trouble. So instead, you can ease them in by giving them an episode recap at the beginning of your paper. So the first encounter that a reader has with your paper should be inviting and easy to get into. A paper that starts with complex terminology and unfamiliar concepts is not going to ease your readers into the flow. Instead, it's going to carry them away with the flood. They'll feel overwhelmed, confused, or even like they're not smart enough to read your paper, and you never want your readers to feel stupid. Now it's helpful to see how this principle works in actual writing, so here's a paragraph that doesn't follow this old before new principle very well. An ornithophile and mixed media muralist, Heather Partridge woke up ready to take on a day full of her favorite activities. Tanagers and Orioles are Heather's favorite birds, so she wanted to find some to inspire her latest work. Down by the river, the large tree was a favorite spot for birds of many kinds, and that is where Heather decided to start. Cackling and fluttering filled the branches of the large tree. The sun gleamed in Heather's eyes while she searched for birds, and then by mixing concrete, pigment, and scrap metal, Heather was finally able to create a stunning representation of her favorite birds for a mural next to the ice cream parlor downtown. Now, if you took some time and looked at this paragraph, you could come to terms with the sequencing and the heap of information that it throws at you. The issue here is not that this paragraph is incomprehensible. The problem is that it's providing more resistance to the reader than it needs to. It just doesn't flow as well as it could. But this is something that we can fix, rewriting it to put old information before new information and providing readers with the context that they need all along the way. As soon as she woke up, Heather Partridge, a bird lover and mixed media artist, was ready for a great day of work. Heather especially loves tanagers and orioles, so she was determined to find some to inspire her latest project. She knew that birds of all kinds liked to visit the tree down by the river, and she decided to head there first. The tree was full of cackling and fluttering birds. Heather peered through the branches, shielding her eyes from the sun and searching for tanagers. After her walk, Heather was inspired to create a stunning representation of her favorite birds in a mural by the ice cream parlor downtown by mixing concrete, pigment, and scrap metal. Now, see how these sentences begin with information that the reader has already encountered before? People know about waking up in the morning, Heather isn't a stranger by the second sentence, and now we know how we got to the tree. It doesn't just appear. All the same ideas are here, but they flow together much more smoothly. Readers don't have to reset and reprocess at the beginning of every sentence because the connections between the sentences are much clearer. The only thing that's really changed is that we've put old information before new information. That is, the start of every sentence points back in some way to a sentence that came before it. The result of following this principle is often called cohesion. If you create smooth transitions from one idea to the next by using what your reader already knows to ease them into something new, you're writing cohesively. And as it turns out, cohesive writing flows. Have you ever gotten stuck listening to someone who has a hard time sticking to one topic? One second they're talking about the weather, the next they're talking about a video they watched about writing conclusions, and then they're off on a tangent about the one time that they spilled ice cream and their pet goat sat down right on top of it. Listening to monologues like this can be really difficult because they lack coherence. They're made up of so many different pieces and ideas that it's hard to figure out how they all go together in the same speech. They don't, in other words, flow at all. The goal of writing coherently is to arrange your ideas into consolidated units. Your paper should be about one overarching topic. Each paragraph should be a contained unit that contributes one main point to that overarching topic, and each sentence should be doing one thing to contribute to the paragraph that it's a part of. In other words, it should be clear to your readers why a group of sentences belong together in the same paragraph and why groups of paragraphs belong together in one paper. If your reader is too busy trying to figure out how and why your ideas fit together, then your writing is presenting more resistance than it needs to. So, by making sure that each part of your paper is focused around a single main idea or purpose, you can help your readers to flow more easily through your work. So, for example, here's a paragraph that leaves a lot to be desired coherence-wise. Good writers write coherently. 
As one noted critic observes, I don't even want to know about writing that goes off on strange tangents. So writing should always be focused. I think the best way to revise is to cut out ideas that don't fit. All in all, strong papers are to the point and centered on one idea. Now, this paragraph is at least doing an okay job of staying on topic, but the sentences aren't working together as well as they could. Strictly speaking, the first paragraph is about writers, the second is about the observation of a critic, the third is about writing, the fourth is about the author's opinion, and the last is about strong papers. These are all related ideas, but they're all different ideas. A thoughtful reader can reconcile the disjointed subjects of each sentence, but these sentences could do more to work together. They could do more to be coherent. So here's a more coherent revision of the same paragraph. Good writing is coherent because, in the words of one noted critic, readers don't even want to know about writing that goes off on strange tangents. So good writing needs to be focused, and that focus can be achieved by cutting out ideas that don't fit. All in all, strong writing is to the point and centered on one idea. Notice that none of the information in the second paragraph changed, but you can also see that all of the sentences are clearly and explicitly about the same thing, good writing. In the second version, the reader doesn't have to take four disparate ideas and then find what they have in common on their own. All the sentences are clearly and explicitly contributing to the same topic. So instead of getting hung up connecting the threads, the reader can just flow along and take it all in. So coherence involves making sure that all of the ideas and pieces of your paper go together, whether that's making sure that sentences fit together in a paragraph or that all of your paragraphs belong in a paper. And it also involves making it easy for your readers to see that they fit together and how they fit together. You don't want a reader trying to figure out why two sentences are next to each other in the same paragraph. And that, combined with our cohesion principle, leads us to something that's important to keep in mind. Try to avoid teasing what's next at the end of a paragraph. Now this is something I see really commonly in the papers that I've graded. Writers get excited about what they're about to say, and so they start teasing it at the end of the paragraph before transitioning to the new topic. But hopefully now you can see why that's a problem. Not only does it introduce a sentence that doesn't really fit with the paragraph that it's in, but it also puts the transition at the wrong place. Remember, the goal is to use a little bit of old information to transition into new information. So you should normally put transitions at the beginnings rather than at the ends of your paragraphs. By teasing the next paragraph at the end of the previous one, you create a kind of cliffhanger, starting a new topic that doesn't get addressed until later. And that's something that can disrupt the flow and leaving the reader wondering why you brought something up only to talk about it later. Now this last principle for semantic flow is maybe a more generalized expression of the previous two principles that we've discussed. And it is that whatever you do in your writing, your ideas should be structured and presented in a way that makes some kind of sense. For example, recipes will usually list ingredients by the order that they're added to the dish. Recipe writers, I guess, could list ingredients alphabetically or by quantity, but that wouldn't make the most sense for someone who's cooking. So by listing the ingredients in the order that they should be added, recipe writers reduce the resistance that cooks will face as they're using a recipe. That is, it's an order that flows most naturally for the purpose of the text that they're writing. So you should be thinking about the progression of ideas that makes the most sense for your reader, and there should be some reason that your ideas are presented in the order that they are. Many arguments, for example, will present a claim first, present some evidence to support that claim, and then explain how the evidence supports the claim. There's a reason for that order because it allows writers to state where they stand and then show the reader why their position is valid. Histories often put ideas in chronological order and that makes an intuitive sort of sense. Your history textbook wouldn't flow very well if it just listed events at random or in the author's order of preference from most favorite to least favorite. And if you're trying to find a diagnosis based on a list of symptoms, the possible causes might be arranged in order from most likely to least likely. Again, the organization of ideas helps the reader to see how those ideas fit together, minimizing confusion, resistance, and the possibility of hypochondriac meltdown. So whatever you do, make sure it's organized in a way that will be clear to you and to your readers. Anytime you give your reader a chance to get stuck trying to figure out why you said what you said, where you said it, is a moment that you risk the loss of flow. By putting your ideas in a clear, logical sequence though, you can keep things flowing right along. 
in the end, flow is about writing that's easy to read, the kind of writing that won't give readers a hard time. One of the main ways that you can make your writing flow is to ensure that your ideas flow easily from one thought to the next, and that's something you can accomplish by presenting old information before new information, easing your readers through your work by writing cohesively, ensuring that the ideas you put together belong together, showing your readers why ideas go together by writing coherently, putting your ideas in an order that makes sense, helping your readers to understand your thought process by writing with structure. As we move on with this series, we'll discuss other ways to make your writing flow at the syntactic and phonetic levels, so please stay tuned for more. In the meantime though, give this video a like if you found it likable, and be sure to share it with a friend. And as always, put your questions and comments down below so that we can keep the discussion going. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you for more writing thrills next week.